<laughs> so it's exactly 9 30 here so welcome to everybody glad that you can make it and uh, welcome to this uh, symposium on sense and avoid technology for small drones i am uh, Hiro de Kroon. i am full professor at the micro air vehicle lab of tu delft and uh, well i'm very glad that we can have this uh, symposium here today so what we'll be uh, talking about today so we'll talking be talking about safely integrating drones into our environment so i don't know if you can see my mouse but uh, here on the bottom right we have two drones so we have the, the parrot bebop and we have the tu delft delta copter and these drones typically are limited to pretty low heights but then still uh, they encounter many things in our environment so for example on the bottom left you can see uh, buildings, you can see trees, you can see windmills, and they need to yeah, avoid by themselves these uh, obstacles if they are to be truly safe. Uh, because if there's a user that puts a GPS waypoint somewhere and doesn't think well about it, then it can happen that uh, there is a building on the way from A to B and the drone will hit this building. So uh, we want these drones to be able to avoid ground-based obstacles. But second, of course, there are other air vehicles and uh, other units, uh, entities using the skies. So on the one hand, on the bottom right, you see birds. Well, birds are actually very, very smart and, and very agile. So we expect them to avoid the drones. But uh, if you think about other air traffic, then drones can uh, be a problem. Uh, and one of the main risks and fears that people have is that there is a rescue helicopter that comes to save somebody and then there's a drone in the way. And there are incidents like this uh, all throughout the world. Uh, and of course, the worst case scenario then is that the drone would hit the helicopter and actually lead to a crash and fatalities. Of course, there's not only helicopters, there can be hot air balloons, people with a parachute or general aviation, but uh, the helicopter is one of the main scenarios. Now, what would we like these drones to do? Uh, we would like them to be able to at least uh, avoid ground-based obstacles, which is something that we worked on in our project. Uh, we would like them to be able to collaborate with other aircraft to avoid each other. But what does this collaboration mean? It, it means that uh, they uh, communicate, for example, coordinates to each other, velocities, intentions. And by doing this, uh, there can be very reliable ways of uh, avoiding each other. But we also want these drones to be able to detect aircraft that are perhaps not emitting their uh, coordinates for one reason or the other, and to be able to avoid those as well. And we call that non-collaborative avoidance. In principle, there are methods to, uh, to do this. The only thing is that often it leads to extra sensors, uh, heavy sensors, which require energy, which are ex expensive. And uh, the question is how effective that is. And so this is uh, what we call the drone pyramid. If you look in the, in the world, there are some big drones like the Predator, and they are very expensive, more than a million euros. There are hundreds of them in the world. There are other models that are much, much lighter, like a Trimble UX5, which are still pretty expensive and uh, very useful as well, by the way, but there are thousands of those in the world. Uh, but if you look at the bottom of this period, the pyramid, we see uh, the typical consumer drones like a DJI or Parrot Bebop, and uh, these are relatively cheap, uh, less than a thousand euros, for example. And there are hundreds of thousands of those and they're being operated by non-professionals. And this is the main fear, of course, uh, that somebody who doesn't know too much about drones and air safety uh, basically causes problems with these. So the question that we had was, can we make even this category that is very cheap, very lightweight, can you make this as safe as possible? This led to the Persified project, which comes from Persevoir Evite, French for sense and avoid, actually. Uh, and our mission was to develop a sensor communication and processing suite for small drones, uh, which would enable detecting and avoiding ground based obstacles and staying well clear of flying air vehicles without necessitating human intervention. The consortium consisted of TU Delft, KU Leuven, and Parrot. And so there were three partners, two academic ones and one uh, commercial partner. Now, today we have our symposium. This is the opening talk. It's almost finished, by the way. And uh, then we will go on to our first keynote speaker, Giancarmina Fasato from University of Naples. 
after that, we will have the three uh, partners in the consortium presenting their work. Uh, and every talk, by the way, ends with a small Q&A, except this opening. So if you have questions for me, wait uh, until my talk later. After the talks of the partners, uh, we have two more keynote speeches, one by Frank Welkenhuizen from Drone Matrix, and he's going to talk about the service-based AI drone network. And finally, Andrew Haitley from Eurocontrol, who is also the PI of the CONOPS consortium in Cesar, and he's going to talk about sense and avoid in use space, and this will place uh, this work into context. So, I went 30 seconds over time, but okay, so uh, it's still okay. I'm, uh, I'm finished for this opening talk. What I will do now is introduce Jan Camina. I will stop sharing so that he, he can start sharing. In the meantime, I can introduce him. And so Jan Camina Fasano is a professor at, at the University of Naples. Uh, and uh, yeah, he is actually, I would say, one of the leading, if not the leading world expert in terms of sense and avoid systems for UAV. So lots of flight testing. And so I'm, I'm very excited that uh, we could uh, invite him here and that he was willing to present uh, to us here. And uh, yeah, without further ado, because I don't want to make, take too much of your time, John Carmine, uh, please go ahead and, uh, and, and start presenting. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Guido. And good morning, everybody. Well, uh, first of all, uh, let me say how happy I am to be to attend uh, this symposium today and uh, let me use 10 seconds to uh, to underline how honored i felt when i was uh, invited uh, given this the importance of the symposium but also to be honest given the amazing work in general that you do at uh, at map lab in delft so for me this is a great pleasure and a great and a great honor so i hope you you are uh, you are able to see my uh, my presentation and uh, basically <clears throat> and i also hope my audio is uh, is okay i will uh, try to provide in this keynote a general discussion about perspective and challenges uh, focusing on non-cooperative sense and avoid which has been my main field uh, field of interest and while trying to to talk in general i will also take this opportunity to discuss something that we we have done we have done in nibbles uh, this is the outline. So after a quick uh, introduction, uh, the presentation will be divided in two, in two parts and trying to offer a wide perspective. In the first part of the talk, I will focus on non-cooperative sense and avoid in the traditional ATM. So also typically at higher altitude, uh, based on what uh, Guido was uh, just saying before, I will summarize some technological developments and I will discuss some flight results from our experience. In the, this will uh, hopefully provide some useful points for the second part of the talk that uh, maybe is more tightly related to the uh, topic of the symposium today and that will deal with non-cooperative sense and avoid in use space UTM. I will try to uh, summarize or to briefly discuss some of the many research paths and open challenges dealing with sensing technologies the link with conflict detection performance, especially for moving traffic, the potential of data fusion, and some recent developments. And finally, I will try to take some, uh, some conclusion. And uh, also, hopefully, this will be uh, useful for some further discussions uh, today. So in general, uh, I would say that uh, detect and avoid or sense and avoid has represented one of the major uh, roadblocks that have hindered in time civilian operations of uh, UAS. So, Together with vulnerabilities of command and control, this has represented a key point for UAS integration. Starting from the early times, a significant technological evolution has led to different uh, frameworks. And in fact, given some general objectives that also following what Widow was saying, uh, consist in avoiding collisions with other traffic, manned and unmanned, and avoiding collisions with fixed obstacles, people or property on the ground, weather clouds. So with these general objectives, of course, the problem gets uh, naturally multidimensional due to the wide variety of UAS and also the different airspace classes in which they operate. Well, typically a useful uh, first level distinction that we can make uh, in, this, uh, in this analysis is to split the problem in two. So sense and avoid for medium large UAS in the 
control their space, or I would say in the traditional ATM environment, and then the more recent sense and avoid at very low altitudes in what has been until today uh, minimally or uncontrolled airspace. And this is the framework of small UAS, but more in general of U space and, uh, and UTM. So when we speak about sense and avoid in ATM, uh, the main focus is on medium large UAS that have to share the airspace with other uh, users, and mostly these are manned aircraft. So uh, moving traffic represented by main aircraft is the main obstacle to avoid and these UAS need to interact with this traffic following some uh, well-defined flight rules and separation minima uh, in en route and terminal uh, in en route and terminal areas and uh, flight rules of course also <clears throat> are well defined depending on uh, instrument flight rules or visual flight rules a traditional concept that has been used here is the need to reach equivalent levels of safety to manned aircraft. And with this objective in mind, the initial definition of sense and avoid has been closely related to a non-cooperative uh, concept because the idea was to mimic a human pilot's capabilities. Of course, the definition of sense and avoid has later evolved to include cooperative technologies, but in general, the non-cooperative field as still as represented and represents the last level of safety. When we consider some, uh, when we try to summarize some developments or challenges uh, here, uh, speaking about non-cooperative uh, challenges, well, these are typically uh, relevant to the high uh, safety levels that are required, to the uh, large, to the high closing speeds that we have, and uh, to the need of these sensors and systems to fulfill different requirements together, such as detection range or uh, field of view coverage that typically can pose contradicting uh, requirements in the sensor design process. Different technological approaches have been followed and most of the efforts of the community have been on radar optical or uh, combined radar optical. And as important technological outcomes of these developments, we had the developments of performance standards for uh, sense and avoid systems and for air to air reader. And connected with this, uh, we have seen some new ad hoc uh, radar sensors that have been developed and that have represented key sensors to test for the first time UAS integration in the national, in the civil airspace without chase planes and uh, observers. You just see a couple of pictures about uh, these, uh, this kind of developments. Well, for some time we <clears throat> have been working uh, in Naples uh, in this uh, field, initially working in collaboration with the Italian Aerospace Research Center. And our activity was focused on non-cooperative sense and avoid, and in particular with main uh, effort at the university on the sensing part, and we developed an integrated radar uh, optical fusion architecture that is based on a few main concepts, such as uh, sensors hierarchy using radar as the main sensor, the concept of uh, central level fusion. So the idea of combining uh, minimally pre-processed measurements, not combining directly tracks at high level, the usage of extended Kalman filtering as the uh, tracking filter uh, engine, and the, uh, and the use of cross-sensor queuing, so the low-level interaction uh, among the sensors. We implemented this approach in flight using an optionally piloted aircraft uh, that you see in this picture. You can also have a quick look at the hardware components. And uh, thanks to this implementation and uh, with commercial components, we tested in flight different functions ranging from uh, real-time radar-based detection and tracking to the multi-sensor-based evolution to uh, autonomous non-cooperative collision avoidance. Based on these experimental data sets, uh, we uh, later also worked on standalone optical-based detection and tracking, but this was done offline. So it is interesting to recall some of the results of this campaign because I believe this uh, provides provide some ideas also for the subsequent extension of discussion at, uh, in new space. So in this test, a reader revealed to be a reliable source of information as long as it was possible to filter ground measurements out. And of course, this kind of problem uh, takes, uh, or in general has to take sensing uncertainty into account and is closely connected to the flight altitude of the, of the own ship platform. 
uh, while radar was reliable in our in this campaign and we have here or we were using the relatively high performance radar uh, the limits of radar only dragging were related to the mainly related to the rough angular accuracies so in range we were very we were very accurate but our degree level uncertainty in angles was uh, reflected in uh, a limit in the angular and angular rate tracking performance so it was natural to uh, try to integrate cameras in order to provide uh, to improve tracking accuracy and thus to improve conflict detection performance here uh, we experimented the challenges of optical uh, detection and tracking basically the wide variety of conditions in terms of uh, weather illumination so also in terms of background and appearance of the intruder and here also in view of real time implementation it was fundamental to work on cross sensor queuing so basically we use a radar based tracking information to help optical detection this was done for example uh, restricting the attention in uh, well defined search windows based on radar tracking but also using some range information within optical within uh, electro optical uh, detection and this was pretty important in making the uh, optical detection uh, reliable Another point that we were able to test is the importance of the own ship navigation system. So the fact that basically we do not only have to consider the obstacle detection sensors themselves, but the overall navigation suite. And this becomes especially important if we have a low measurement rate. And trying to implement these multi-sensor architectures, we also dealt with some implementation challenges, such as out-of-sequence measurements and relative sensors, relative sensors alignment, which of course pose challenges when we have completely different sensors such as uh, cameras and uh, and reader. Uh, finally, by working on this, uh, by working on this uh, on this stuff, we uh, were able to see in flight the improvement due to multi-sensor fusion, and basically thanks to the possibility of uh, increasing the angular accuracy, it was demonstrated that in terms of time to closest point of approach, we were able to keep the same performance of radar only, while the main advantage was in the prediction of the future minimum distance, so the distance at closest point of approach. And uh, this is shown in this diagram where you see the reference that comes from uh, GPS data and the uh, multi-sensor tracker that is much closer compared with the radar uh, only, this is uh, a lot relevant to an encounter. Of course, each, uh, each trend is consistent with the accuracy that we, we could expect. And to show you an example of the kind of tests and the advantage of multi-sensor fusion, this is a frontal encounter without avoidance, without avoidance maneuver, where you see that as long, uh, well, uh, as we have measurements from uh, enough associated measurements from radar, we can start tracking and then we can drive optical detection. And as we get measurements from optical sensors, this can be fused, increasing the accuracy. So finally, this becomes a, uh, a context where we can take the best from our, uh, from our sensors. So combining uh, the, uh, the detection range performance with uh, the sensing accuracy that is, uh, that is required. Well, <clears throat> this was interesting regarding wind sensor fusion, but actually we tested uh, fully autonomous non-cooperative avoidance also only with, uh, only with reader. And what we did uh, here is to plug the sensing segment to the decision-making uh, part with an autonomous avoidance algorithm developed by our colleagues at, uh, at Chira. Uh, we experimented some encounters where you see uh, some results here where you have the these asterisks re representing the points of minimum distance and we were imposing a limit of 150 meters at that time horizontal horizontal and vertical so i guess the important uh, or an interesting point here was that uh, this kind of tests uh, were carried out let's say uh, with full success uh, even in radar only configuration, given the uh, low closing speeds that we have and the aircraft maneuverability characteristics, which highlight, uh, which highlights the concept that sensing requirements have to be connected which, uh, with the encounter scenarios. 
that we uh, that we have so uh, we cannot let's say discuss sensing performance as a standalone as a standalone topic another interesting point was to observe in this kind of tests the link between sensing performance and the avoidance uh, strategy and this is evident on this in these di diagrams on the uh, right where you see an example of uh, reader and tracking data uh, with an avoidance with an avoidance maneuver and you can see that as long as we start uh, start the avoidance maneuver and here basically there is no latency between uh, start of film tracking beginning of film tracking and avoidance you can see that uh, we have a large number of ground decos that have to be filtered out just because of the attitude motion of the aircraft and also we have a significant degradation of the rate of valid measurement so this is something that the tracking algorithm has to uh, has to cope with and this highlights the fact that we especially non cooperative sensing we have to uh, consider together or we have to keep into account the tight link between the sensing function and the avoidance and the avoidance maneuver and final uh, interesting point was uh, how was relevant to how the information could be provided to uh, UAS to RPAS uh, operators and we did something for example what you are seeing in this video is uh, a possible implementation that we were working with some time uh, ago relevant to a TCAS like way of providing the information to the uh, to the operators of course there has been a very significant progress in the community in these years uh, about this fact with the development of displays including conflict proving and with the idea of providing maneuvering suggestions to uh, UAS operators because finally even in highly autonomous uh, architectures uh, or if we consider remotely piloted architectures we have to consider that the limited awareness of the operators also deals with avoidance so uh, this creates let's say a blurred region between full autonomy and uh, remotely operated avoidance this kind of uh, indication or this discussion is also linked with manned aviation because these kind of sensors can provide enhanced safety for manned flight and also could be useful in emergency conditions. Okay, jumping to the second part of the presentation, sense and avoid in U space UTM uh, will represents a much more recent uh, framework that has some similarities. Uh, and basically it is uh, somehow a, a problem that is scaled down in terms of speeds and dimensions, but also there are some key differences. Of course, this framework has come from the increase of small UAS applications. And uh, this is a, uh, as, we, as we know very well, this is a new evolving uh, environments with new users with various dynamics and also with a strong link with UAM <coughs> concepts and UAM systems represent new entrants in this context well here uh, there is uh, and we are working on this a strong emphasis on the infrastructure on network traffic control technologies and the consequent needs in terms of communication navigation and uh, and surveillance including ground-based sense and avoid and uh, here as also Guido was saying before our avoidance uh, needs are relevant to a mixed environment with manned and unmanned uh, system, but also with uh, ground with ground obstacles. So this is a more heterogeneous situation. In this framework, onboard sense and avoid is considered as a, an important component, and it is widely agreed that this should involve both cooperative and non-cooperative technologies. With non-cooperative technologies, as with the usual concept of last level of safety, somehow, this is an open framework. And this also explains why there are many active areas of research and investigation. Uh, open points regard the relation between the infrastructure based concepts, the cooperative distributed sense and avoid and non cooperative sense and avoid, the definition of requirements, sensing requirements, safety levels, flight rules, and the links, the development of sensing and decision making approaches that are tailored for small UAS systems and for the complex environments that we have and also finally <clears throat> the link between avoidance and navigation challenges uh, especially in very low altitude uh, in very low altitude operation so if we restrict our attention uh, on uh, 
on non-cooperative sense and avoid uh, technologies, uh, what we uh, what we have is that uh, available commercial technologies are limited uh, for small UAS are limited at close large uh, obstacles, and there is a clear need to increase range and address avoidance of moving obstacles. The available technologies comprise cameras, readers, lidars, and acoustic. Uh, I will focus on the first three also because there are some interesting developments from uh, from Delft also on the fourth uh, on the acoustic uh, technologies. So in terms of cameras, uh, there of course there is there are in general no ad hoc sensors for these uh, function, um, with the exception of event cameras for close range uh, applications and main trends of interest concern algorithms. There are now several available uh, solutions uh, that exploit also commercial solution that exploit different approaches such as morphological filtering and more recently uh, artificial intelligence. When we consider the results of flight uh, analysis by different research groups, of course, as it is <coughs> intuitive, we uh, all the groups have experimented a strong dependence on weather illumination and on the conditions in terms of the background so sky region versus below the horizon conditions in general uh, some numbers that uh, have been uh, seen in different analysis are that we need a few pixels for reliable declaration in optimal conditions but there can be a significant increase in challenging condition of course the problem of sense and avoid does not deal only with detecting and tracking but also with uh, detecting conflicts with moving traffic uh, especially and here we have techniques approaches that work with line of sight and line of sight rate or range based uh, approaches well we can perform range estimation with uh, with cameras but of course at relatively large range and so especially for moving up so these can pose challenges so whatever is the approach that is considered stereo vision shape based ranging or passive ranging with maneuvers these can pose challenges uh, for a relatively large range uh, considering other technologies we then have uh, readers and here we uh, have had a development of uh, small readers based on uh, frequency modulated continuous wave uh, technology. So we have a number of systems and there is a strong link with automotive uh, technology. Uh, actually, one typical challenge here is to combine the wide field of view coverage with the necessity to have degree level angular accuracy and different approaches are possible with multi channel techniques and or uh, innovative beam steering approaches. If we give a look at the radar systems that are present on the market, basically we have different classes because we have some systems that are really ultralight systems with a few tens of grams, others that are uh, with a, a weight, with a mass of the order of one, of one kilogram. Uh, of course, in general, the low target detectability is a challenge, especially for low power, low gain solutions. And this poses challenges for moving traffic avoidance. Another point is that if we consider the uh, really ultralight readers, typically there are challenges in providing uh, measurements that are similar to large, large readers, so accurate range and degree level angles together with uh, relatively large detection, detection range. So some, we performed some experiments with uh, these ultralight uh, readers and uh, we performed some experiments of detection range for example using ground uh, using ground setup and as it could be predicted actually from radar equation uh, budgets uh, when we consider very small uh, uas we get a detection range of a few tens of meters that is uh, hard to be that is not really compatible with some moving traffic avoidance scenario uh, scenarios however uh, however, these ultralight solutions can be suitable for navigation and fixed obstacle avoidance. And actually, the same ultralight sensors uh, were used uh, in some navigation uh, in challenging environments uh, studies. You see an example here of very low altitude flight in our campus and the range measurements that are uh, provided by the, by the reader. So there is uh, potential, but the ultralight solutions seem to be limited with respect to the avoidance of moving or moving traffic of course this is what we have uh, without uh, let's say using the currently available technologies and not building some further uh, some further advancements also on processing 
Another uh, area that is interesting is LiDAR. And here, the technological evolution is mostly driven by autonomous driving and mobile, uh, mobile mapping application. Well, here, there is the potential of applicability for non-cooperative sense and avoid with some challenges uh, that are essentially relevant to some sparse coverage that we tend to have uh, the typically limited fog in elevation and some challenges in the detection in the detection range again this can pose challenges for moving traffic applications there are different sensor classes and again we can individuate some really ultralight sensors that are compatible for very small drones and larger sensors that are uh, compatible with small ways but in a different in a different class so summarizing we have challenges and as we had in ATM, these challenges are connected with the limited detection range and sensing accuracy uh, compared with the scenarios that we may want to consider. Uh, here, the detection issues are emphasized by low altitude operations, uh, both for radar and cameras. And since uh, some sensor budgets are compatible with multi-sensor uh, installations, uh, data fusion comes out as a potential solution. Of course, there is need of an end-to-end -end performance assessment. And uh, especially in view of traffic avoidance scenario, we have to work at conflict detection level. So the basic idea here is that we have to consider sensing performance, sensors and algorithms. But as we consider moving traffic application, we have other elements that become very important, such as conflict detection criteria, encounter geometry and speeds, the maneuverability, separation minima. And a common ground to compare different sensing solutions is represented by probabilities of missed conflict detection and false, uh, and false conflict detection. There are some analyses that have been presented in, uh, in literature. And uh, well, just summarizing some studies that also we, uh, we have made uh, here. In terms of conflict detection criteria, we typically uh, may have to adopt different uh, different principles because as we are able to estimate with uh, good accuracy range and range rate we can use distance at closest point of approach and time and we can build criteria based on these quantities with uncertainties if we use purely passive architectures and we are not able to have a reliable range estimation typically we have to work with line of sight and line of sight rate and one possible approach is to accept some over conservative uh, criteria where basically, since we do not have an accurate range and range rate, we use worst case assumption. Uh, this clearly makes uh, optical uh, tracking or uh, this clearly makes conflict detection based on cameras over conservative. Uh, a second point is that when we consider non-cooperative sensing, there are challenges in declaring tracks and we have a stochastic nature of detection and declaration. And we have to consider typically this at conflict uh, detection level. So uh, we have to consider our probabilities of missed or forced conflict detection, accounting for the fact that a missed conflict detection may be due to a track that is not established, and a false conflict detection may be due to a conflicting false track. When we plug everything, uh, everything together, uh, what comes out is the clear combination of declaration range performance and tracking accuracy. So they will contribute together with our conflict detection performance. We performed some numerical analysis in past papers, also other colleagues have done uh, this. And if we use the parameters of the sensors that are on the market, what comes out is that uh, the best option still uh, lies in combining relatively long range, so the larger uh, radar-based uh, radars with uh, with cameras because in this way we can have an optimal trade-off between missed detection and false uh, and false alarm on the other hand if we consider the typical speeds that we may have in u uh, space or for small uh, uas the applicability of lidar uh, seems to be more limited to scenarios with uh, limits in closing speeds or to lateral uh, scenarios while vision-based systems may suffer in general from may have a relatively large uh, declaration range but in general will suffer from this over conservative approach to conflict detection since we do not have accurate range uh, estimates so of course 
uh, I, I'm not going in details uh, here, but I guess the important uh, concept here uh, is that this kind of problems for moving traffic require an integrated approach with all the parameters, with all the variables that are involved, not only the sensors, uh, let's say specification. This is something that the community is working on. And also we are uh, working in this framework with uh, hopefully new papers that will, that will come out. Few considerations on... Uh, so um, five minutes for the talk and the questions. So I hope. That's... Okay, okay, yeah. Guido. Thanks. So I'm. Uh, uh, I will try to. Okay, I will try to stay in time. So considerations on data fusion. Uh, well, it is likely that in this framework we need data fusion as a good potential, but we will need customized fusion approaches where we need to operate at raw data level, at detection level, and there is the possibility that fusion is multi-mode. So not only reader to camera, but also camera to reader or other uh, interactions. And also it's possible that for different objects, we will have different modes of conflict detection and avoidance. Uh, implementation challenges of data fusion may be emphasized by the adoption of consumer grade uh, avionics. Uh, just to finish, some current activities on uh, sensing. We are working on radar based architectures, but here we had some uh, standby period because in our flight testing and I will focus on uh, some innovative vision based techniques that we have uh, that we are working that we are working with. In the past, we had developed uh, some vision based architectures for sky region that were using morphological filtering and then a multi temporal processing strategy. So our first idea was to extend this framework to small uh, UAS, of course, needing to investigate the below the horizon framework that was not considered in these previous in these previous studies. Uh, working on this, we started to implement some uh, deep learning concept in the direction, and we are working now on the architecture that you see in the slide, where basically the idea is to uh, work with different modes below and above the horizon. Uh, the idea is to use different detectors. So we use uh, different neural networks that with different training below the horizon and above the horizon. Training is at relatively large range, but uh, beyond after deep learning based detection, we absolutely need multi-temporal processing. And the multi-temporal processing has differences above and below the horizon. In particular, the, uh, we are trying to address the uh, problems relevant to below the horizon tracking by using motion compensation and a local frame differencing because a typical problem at very low altitude is slow uh, ground moving targets that uh, might result in a very uh, low angular rate. We are, uh, we are performing flight, flight tests and model aircraft uh, airfields and this is just some examples with custom drones and an interesting point is that uh, here we are uh, using uh, drones that uh, are both uh, on ship and intruder for, for each other. And also we try to maximize the outcome of flight tests having simultaneously above the horizon and below the horizon conditions. So this is a typical example of two uh, almost simultaneous videos. Well, you can see that of course, above the horizon, we have some challenges uh, and uh, relatively easy challenges somehow, especially in, this con in these conditions, while below the horizon, the problem gets much more complex. This is just an example of the results. This is something that is in progress. Of course, we are uh, uh, evaluating this performance level difference and with a larger detection range and better accuracy, accuracy above the horizon. But below the horizon, we have to accept a lower detection range. But what we are seeing is that these multi-temporal strategies are very important to avoid that we generate false, uh, false tracks, especially due to ground, uh, to ground objects. So this is something that looks promising and of course requires further, further work. We are, as also many other colleagues in the community, uh, we are developing a number of points. And here I would like to underline that the uh, need of larger data sets is, uh, is important coupled with the possibility to use some data set augmentation and reinforcement learning, uh, learning techniques. So uh, this is just for what we are doing and 
I hope I was not long as I often as I often do. Uh, going to the perspective and conclusions, uh, I will say that sense and avoid. Uh, uh, both non-cooperative and cooperative is an exciting and evolving framework. Uh, since we do not have, in general, uh, one accepted uh, answer, also because of the multidimensionality, we have a very active research, both in uh, sense and avoid in ATM and in uh, use space. In ATM, we have a link with also enhanced safety for manned aviation. As we consider UTM, of course, uh, this evolution of uh, low altitude sense and avoid is closely related to the use space concept. And I would underline the need for an integrated approach and also somehow a technology aware approach that takes into account what we have with current sensing technologies. UAM is a new entrant uh, here. And actually UAM uh, was with different classes of UAM vehicles that are proposed and emission from uh, sense and avoid in ATM and sense and avoid in uh, in new space because in some phases of the mission uh, we basically will fly for some vehicles in the more traditional ATM. If we concentrate on new space it is likely and it is reasonable again as also Widow was saying that we consider also here different uh, different frameworks and so there is some multidimensionality to be considered also in new space. We have a very active research community that is working on that is working sorry on uh, trends such as artificial intelligence innovative sensors and avoidance in constrained environments and i would like to underline two needs or two points that can foster the research progress one point is the importance of outdoor flight testing in relevant environments i just read the report from a nasa utm tcl4 uh, experiments where they underline how important it was to test in a relevant environment and to test not only, let's say, uh, sense and avoid, but also the other uh, technologies uh, together. I believe it would be important to foster this kind of flight testing for all the research community, also in Europe. And also this is connected to the potential of shared data sets and benchmark as it is done, for example, in navigation applications where the community is the research is fostered by the fact that there are some widely available benchmarks. I'm thinking about vision inertial problems, for examples. This is something that if we if flight testing for research is easier, this is something that can become easier and also flight challenges to simulate development of non-cooperative uh, solution. So, and uh, these are this is contact information also with the hydrogen avionic systems panel that is uh, that I'm pleased to work with and that is a good place for this uh, discussion. So I'm open to questions and I really hope uh, Guido I was not uh, too long to uh, let's say create issues in the agenda of today. <laughs> no problem Giancarmine. Thank you again. It was a great talk. I mean uh, concerning time we will just take a little time off the questions from the consortium. Uh, super interesting and I would like to say to those that are watching that Giancarmine and I we didn't talk before about our presentation so one of <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, like about data sets and benchmarks, it may be that you see it again today, and this was not uh, agreed before, but uh, beautiful. Thank you, Giancamina. Let's take uh, time for one or two questions from the audience uh, for the keynote speaker. Are there questions? <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I have a, a question, Bart Vermes from TU Delft. So, um, in the non cooperative uh, uh, avoidance strategy, uh, the benchmark is always uh, the human pilot. Uh, do we know uh, how, what the distance is a human pilot can, uh, can track other manned aircraft or can track other drones? Because if that's the benchmark, then if your sensors do better, then it should be fine already. Yeah, I guess this is part of the, especially in EU space, this is part of the <clears throat> open, open framework, because I guess if we consider, uh, let's say, traditionally, we have been working with this equivalent level of safety, and there were studies about uh, providing quantitative estimates of the capabilities of human pilots. So 
if we consider integration with all manned aircraft in the ATM, this makes sense. I would say that uh, maybe in new space, uh, we will go, let's say, beyond the idea of mimicking uh, human, uh, human pilots, because maybe we will define uh, together which is, in some scenarios, which are the required levels of safety that we have to achieve. Also, with regard to the obstacles, so small UAS versus small UAS uh, will not require or should not require the same level of safety of small UAS versus a manned aircraft at low altitude. So maybe the approach could be not much to, let's say, mimic in this the human ground pilot for small UAS, but to define in an independent way the levels, the levels of, the, of safety. Of course, when we try to think about what the human pilot does for small UAS, this is very much connected, I guess, with the concept of which is the separation, uh, which are the separation minima that, as you, as you said, that should be, should be considered. And maybe here, what we will do as a first idea uh, would be to scale down some concepts used in ATM. Because basically in ATM, we have near mid-air collision and typically the distances are depend in some way on the physical dimension of the aircraft that actually will be smaller than these minimum distances where well, maybe we can do similar we can apply a similar approach for small UAS so we can define this separation minima that will be enough larger than the physical dimension of the of the UAS that we are working with so this could be a path to follow but in general I would say I guess that uh, we should, or we could, uh, as an idea, go beyond the concept of mimicking human pilots. I think that's a, that's a great idea, and I think also indeed that, uh, that these kinds of criteria are actually still yeah, part of an active discussion, uh, of course. Which yeah. I hope uh, at the end of today we can uh, end the program. It says concluding remarks, but we can also have a discussion about such points. So I want to thank you again, Jan Camine. In the interest of time, I'm going to move to the next uh, uh, speaker. Thank uh, you. So for Sophie, uh, don't worry, just give your talk. We'll just uh, limit a little bit more the questions so that we catch up the time as we go, uh, especially in the partner uh, presentations. So um, thank you again, Jan Camine. Really great and uh, very interesting work. So yeah, and hopefully we will still talk at the end a bit. So, uh, thank okay, you. okay. I will continue to attend, of course. Thank you. Okay, Sophie, can you share your screen? Perfect. Voila. Can you see it? Yes. And can you hear me as well? We can see and hear you, but we do see the presenter view. Uh, so we do see the two screens uh, in your case. It's not a problem, but uh, yeah, this is better. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Wow. Okay. Um, so thank you very much uh, for uh, being able to talk here for this audience. It's really an honor for me. Uh, also, thank you for um, the nice presentation uh, already. So um, it will be easy for me to, to complement this story. So we uh, have been working also a little bit on uh, conflicts or collision avoidance or conflict management for drones. But we uh, focus on wireless communication, so we, we are more in the domain of collaborative or cooperative collision avoidance. So um, we all uh, know that drones are fantastic, and so they have a lot, at some, in some sense, a positive public perception. And so they are the development and creativity enabler. They are associated with high-tech business, artistic performances, uh, shows, drone shows. They're, um, believed to be price efficient, so we can automate a lot of tasks like security and we don't need safety guards anymore, but drones could take it over. They could close the technology gap. Uh, it's fantastic technology that everybody can use. They can enable safety, search and rescue operations, um, wildfires, floods, and so on. So there's lots of positive things uh, related to drones. But as you all know, there are also some negative aspects. Uh, sometimes they're associated with military applications. Some people think drones are just toys and they're good to play with, but there's nothing serious you can do with them. There are also privacy concerns and they could yeah, monitor us constantly and we have almost no privacy anymore. 
But I think the biggest concern is indeed still the safety issue. So it can fall, they can collide, there can be attacks, terrorism, airports, issues, etc. So that's why it's indeed important to have a very good um, technology to create safe drones. And that's what we are all working on today and discussing today. So I'm not going to spend more time on the introduction. I'm going to go on with the technical part of my uh, talk. So I'm going to talk on two simple things today. So on today's menu is drone communication. So what do we know about communication in the air? How should we do it? And then I'm going to talk about uh, what we call conflict management for drones. Uh, we have had a nice, fantastic talk about uh, non-collaborative conflict management. So I'm not going to talk about this at all. I'm just going to talk a little bit about cooperative approaches. So in my team, we do a lot of analysis of wireless communication performance, specifically for UAVs. We do that using theory, simulations, but also a lot of experiments. So I'll come back to that later. I also believe we should do more experiments, create more data sets, do more tests. But when we talk about drones, there are often a lot of limitations and there are regulatory limitations, but also weather issues. And yeah, it's not so easy to do extensive uh, tests. So that's why we built a simulator. So here you see some screenshot of our uh, simulator. So it's a 3D simulator that uh, can be used to simulate the performance of all wireless technologies. Here I focus on 4G or LTE. So here you see a floor plan of a small, a small city. It's the city of Ghent in Belgium. So you see the rivers and the streets and the houses. And you also see the dots, which are the base stations that are currently installed in the city of Ghent. And each base station has a number. And this number corresponds to a color here. And here in this animation, you see kind of users flying up. So they start at ground level when you still see the street pattern, the users are at ground level. So let's wait a bit until it comes back. Voila, this is the ground level, but you easily go higher. And what you see is depending on the altitude, the best base station, so the color at every spot is the best base station that you see, it changes a lot as function of altitude. So if here a user on the ground is connected to base station 12, if you go up, you, 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 you constantly see different base stations. And that's important to know that uh, as a function of altitude, you can have a very different communication performance. So we simulated it further. So uh, for communication, uh, people, we like to talk about signal to interference and noise ratio. It's a metric of how good the signal quality is. And here we see the altitude. And you see that initially, our signal to interference and noise ratio goes up, which is good because by flying higher, we have actually better uh, quality than we would have on the ground. But if we go up further, we see that the communication performance degrades significantly. Here you see a more detailed zoom. So um, from this figure, I'm not going to go too much into details. It may be too technical, but you see that the best altitude for the city of Kent is 40 meter which is just above a rooftop level. If you go further and further and further, you see that everybody gets a negative SNR, which means you get so much interference that the signal is drowning. Of course, we like to do experiments. So we did a lot of experiments. I'm going to zoom in on all of them. I'm just going to highlight one. It's an experiment we did with a little plane. We were flying along the coast in Belgium. And here we see a very simple metric the number of cells you can detect as function of altitude. And you see very clearly the higher you fly, the more cells you see. So while normally at ground level, maybe you could see two or three cells. At 150 meters, you already see on average 10 cells. And at 300 meters, you are on already on average more than 20 cells. So it's a lot of cells you can see. This study shows that drone communication is really limited by interference. Another thing that I wanted to mention when we talk about uh, drone communication and especially drone communication with cellular networks is that the antenna pattern matters a lot. So here you see a typical antenna. So the, you should imagine the base station here. I did not draw it. And the antenna is typically installed very high and it is typically tilting a little bit toward the ground because most cellular networks are designed to provide good ground coverage. 
And a typical antenna looks a bit like that. So you have your bore side, so the main lobe, and there you have a very good um, gain. And then you have all these little side lobes. So when my UAV is going up an altitude, what you see is that you, you, you go up an altitude like this. So first you get out of the main lobe into a, a node, but then you start to see uh, the antenna again through all the little side lobes, but these little side lobes are really small. Huh? So this means that depending on altitude, it could trigger a lot of handovers and connectivity issues because you constantly see all these little spikes from all the base stations in the neighborhood. So it's, it's important to consider that. Okay, so this is what I wanted to, to mention about drone communication. So the good thing is we see a lot of cells in the air, but the bad thing is um, they create a lot of interference and they also see a lot of side lobes. So we need, we, we need to think about handover management techniques, cell planning, etc. if we really want to massively use uh, cellular networks in the sky. But they work. Um, I'm going to zoom on already to um, the second part of my talk, which is conflict management for drones, um, which is the essence of our work for this uh, Perkevit uh, project. So um, let's consider this UTM architecture. So we have um, a UAV traffic management provider that ideally uh, interacts with all the stakeholders. So, the stakeholders could be UAV operators that want to uh, use the airspace for several or whatever UAV applications or missions. You have the regulator that have to give uh, permissions. You have supplemental data providers that uh, give information on the weather, but altitude, terrain profiles, but also, of course, um, these kind of connectivity maps that I showed before could be uh, included so that we know where the drone can have good connectivity and at which altitude they should fly to have a, a reliable link, etc. They, of course, should also interact with aerial traffic management. Otherwise, yeah, the, yeah, accidents could happen and other stakeholders could be public users, etc. And another important task of such a new TM architecture is, of course, conflict management. So when we talk about conflict management, and I wanted to define it here, we see actually uh, traditionally three layers of um, yeah, conflict management or deconfliction. The first layer is what we call strategic deconfliction. It's actually mission scheduling, and that's where an UTM provider can play a, a role. Huh? By scheduling missions in such a way that the UAV density is not too high in certain areas, we can already avoid a lot of problems. But if UAVs become very popular, um, we, we will not be able to rely on mission scheduling alone anymore. And we will also need uh, what we call tactical deconfliction, which is deconfliction during the mission. And also here we see two levels. We have a well clear area, which is the safe region. So we ensure separation between UAVs, uh, but also um, persons, animals, whatever but it's not yet um, yeah, in a dramatic uh, situation that uh, collisions could happen. And then we have here the co uh, collision avoidance, tactical deconfliction, which means that, okay, we stop the mission, we do an abrupt maneuver because a collision is going to happen. So what we need to do is we need to define these, uh, these methods of, for tactical deconfliction well also for small UAVs. So we've looked a bit into literature and we found that typically these things are defined using what we call uh, well clear ranges. So here you see a UAV and there's two yeah, cylinders defined around it. Um, one is uh, the collision avoidance uh, uh, region, which is a region where yeah, if two UAVs, if another UAV would be here, uh, the mission should stop or an abrupt maneuver should happen. And this is a well clear region, which is like a safe region to stay uh, separated. If you look into literature, you see various numbers. And so one paper here has um, for horizontal and vertical uh, well clear regions, something in the order of magnitude of 600 meter. And then for collision avoidance regions, it's below 150 meters. So this is actually um, 
quite large. And another paper for an urban environment and smaller drones has considered even smaller uh, distances for the Valkyrie region and very small distances for collision avoidance, so only three meters. I think it would be good to have a debate on these numbers. And of course, they will depend on the environment. So here the numbers are different because one is suburban, the other is urban. The speed of the UAV, the size of the UAV. Also, this paper considered both fixed swing and um, hovering UAVs. Of course, depending on the type of UAV, the, the maneuvers that can be done are different. So also different regions should be defined. Considering these kind of regions here, if you see that here the well clear region are quite far, eh? so we talk about 600 to meter to one kilometer. So this means we need a very long um, communication distance, and also the, maybe the non-collaborative techniques maybe cannot deal well with just high distance. So we look into the use of wireless communication for this kind of deconfliction and see what would be a good technology. So here I'm, uh, we made a tree. So we have the conflict management um, techniques. We have the non-collaborative ones. But the presentation before me was fantastic on this level. Uh, I classify these as um, having a range a bit like this, between 50 meters to uh, ultimately one kilometer. And they have a good passive radar. Um, it's definitely useful for conflict, collision avoidance, but if you want to ensure well clear ranges that are more than one kilometer, there might be some limitation here. And then we have collab collaborative uh, solutions, which rely on communication. And then we have the short range communication technologies like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and also long range like LoRa or ADSB can be considered. And if we rely on the ground infrastructure, LTE, LoRa, ADSB, et cetera, um, we could even, yeah, go to very, we could cover the, the globe. Eh? Sophie, we still have yeah. five minutes for the presentation. And okay. I'm almost done. I'm almost oh, great. Done. Yeah, okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> so um, the main message that we want to bring here is that if you look in all the, a lot of wireless technologies exist, all of them can be analyzed. We all know more or less the ranges, etc. So we could decide very well if they fit in which kind of um, range scenario they could fit. But this table, the measured table, is very open. So not a lot of people have done a lot of measurement yet. So it's definitely something where we need more work. We need to characterize multiple technologies, see how well they work in the sky or the interference limited, etc. We have focused uh, mainly on these two technologies for the Perkipit project, so Wi-Fi and LoRa, so I'll zoom in a bit on them more. So what is Wi-Fi? We all know Wi-Fi. It's a proven technology. It has, um, the summary is fantastic size and cost properties. So everybody uses it, it's integrated everywhere. It's super small, super cheap, super robust, super good proven. So it could be a fantastic technology for a um, collaborative um, conflict management. The only problem is the Wi-Fi protocol works in such a way that you typically have to set up a connection with your access point. And of course, that takes sometimes several seconds. So it's a no-go if, um, if you want to use this for conflict management. What we have done is we have uh, studied if we could just broadcast the GPS location as your network name. So you put your, your uh, GPS information in your SSID. So it, the SSID field has 32 usable bytes, which typically is used for the name. Huh? People always come up with kind of the most understandable names for their Wi-Fi network. We have explored, could we use this name for just putting the location? And we also came up with a protocol that enables uh, that determines how often you, you should send those beacons, how you should receive them, etc., to have an as good as possible uh, reliability of detection. I'm not going to go too much into the details, but depending on some protocol parameters, um, you can tune a little bit um, how long it takes, so how much messages per second you can receive using this Wi-Fi kind of ADSB, which is just putting the GPS information in, as this SSID. It works. We have also measured it in the air uh, by measurement. And also important to know is you could also use this. It could coexist with data. 
the data of loads. So, so a lot of UAVs use Wi-Fi for sending video or telemetry information, depending on, of course, this is how much uh, networking throughputs you have. There's of course a trade-off. Uh, if you send a lot of video data, you have less time left for sending these location beacons. But you could, we, we have a good understanding of the parameter tuning to enable both of them. And depending on the, the definition of the well clear ranges, etc., an optimal uh, protocol setting could be determined. This is my last slide, Guido. So, of course, we should not only focus on Wi Fi. So, Wi Fi here is shown to be a good technology. We have chosen it as a first to study because these Wi Fi modules, as you can see here, they are super small and super cheap, and we could put them on the smallest drones ever. Uh, even we have tested this protocol on the cheapest, smallest Wi-Fi model uh, that we could find. It was less than a few grams. It had a super small microcontroller, but putting the location update as as a function uh, as part of the SSID. Any chipset on the market can do that. So there are no hardware limitations. The only thing we need to do is a firmware update and the firmware could, could be developed, or at least we developed it for the smallest possible Wi-Fi module we could find. So it's a good technology for small drones. Of course, if you scale up your drone, maybe the Wi-Fi ranges are not enough anymore. So we have measured Wi-Fi performance to be good up to one kilometer max. So if you want to have a conflict management that goes further than one kilometer, you need other technologies such as LoRa, LTE, or a software-defined radio that can receive ADS-B messages and for, for collision avoidance with planes. So for Perkevit, we have developed two modules, the smallest Wi-Fi module with our protocol and a larger module that um, integrates all the technologies that should be measured. Of course, I said here, we urgently need to do measurements. We plan to do them with our module, but then Corona came in the way and we, we, we were not allowed by the university to do a lot of tests, but we hope we can do them over summer and fill in that table a little bit more. Within right. the project, I have one more sentence. Within Sorry. the project, what you also, also, of course, did is... It's okay? One sentence. Yeah, we also integrated how these communication modules should interact, of course, with the flight computer, because if you get an interrupt that some LTE message has been received, that you will have a collision, you need to take appropriate actions, of course. Yeah? So this was also working. So summary. Summary is very short. Drones have high potential, right? UTM will make them more safe, right? Telecom professionals, of course, we cannot define our communication requirements alone. We need to talk with avionics experts, like because we have no idea what's a good range, six meter, one kilometer, 10 kilometer, et cetera. And uh, together we can define the communication requirement. And then uh, I believe that Wi-Fi, 4G, and in the future also 5G, but I dropped 5G today, offer huge advantages, of course, to, for creating safe drones. Voila. This was um, my, I, I thought it was a short presentation, but apparently not short enough. Oh, it was okay. Thank you, Sophie. Very nice. Uh, <laughs> let me do the virtual hand clapping as well. <laughs> is there, uh, while, while the next speaker is setting up, perhaps there can be a question uh, to uh, Sophie from the audience, if there is one. You can either speak or you can type it in the chat. Uh, hello, hello, uh, Sofia. This is Alberto Menela speaking. I have a curiosity more than a question uh, about the the last part, um, the, the not this slide, the previous slide, uh, where you showed yes, this uh, this modem here is this is a, uh, I believe is a simcom for four G um, communication, LTE communication. I was just wondering if you also uh, take in consideration the narrow band IoT technology for, for transmission. Yes, so the LTE module um, supports both uh, LTE M1 and, and narrow band IoT. Okay. So the, the idea is to compare and did both where a narrow band IoT uh, 
has less handover support, but I think that might be an advantage because otherwise you might trigger too much handovers. So this is also, um, yeah, and within the LTE module um, foreseen. Okay. Because uh, because we we made, we made the different tests with narrowband IoT with, with the same uh, uh, modem manufacturer and we we had quite interesting results for drone tracking in especially for the battery consumption so that was an important account for from our side. Uh, however, uh, we experienced some delays in uh, in the, in the, for tracking transmission up to ten seconds. Uh, considering the actual uh, operators. So I was just wondering if you made some sort of test and uh, if you had some similar experience. But to, to, to be honest, we did not, um, yeah, we did not do a lot of tests yet with the LTE module. So I think it would be interesting indeed to, to start from your experience and see what other tests we should do and, and see if we could share, share ideas there. Um, Unless some, um, yeah, I'm not aware of similar experience. I'm, I also, we did not do a lot of tests yet because the last three months we were um, in lockdown. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes, but we and would we be, very, it be yeah. very happy to, to, to yeah. share experiences uh, with you. So <laughs> thank you. That would be very interesting. And okay. So thank you, Sophia, a lot. Sorry, I didn't even introduce you properly. <laughs> 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 Professor Sky <Skyler>. Logan. <laughs> And so, anyways, so. yeah, need to save time. Huh? <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. And very if there are other questions, then uh, people can still ask them in the chat, and they can be answered by Sophie and her team. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, if Martin could uh, set up his screen. Hi, Martin. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So Martin is uh, a research and development uh, manager at uh, SA, and uh, yeah. He was uh, managing their part of the Persified project. So I'm very glad, Martin, that you uh, could today and, uh, present uh, your work on obstacle avoidance. So I'm sure any Thank everybody- Thank you for having me. Uh, can you see my screen? It's perfect, uh, Martin, yeah. All right, great. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for offering me to talk about our work today. and. Thank you, uh, Jean Carmine, and thank you, Sophie, for your very interesting presentations. Um, so today I'm going to present you our uh, latest work at Parrots uh, related to obstacle avoidance uh, feature development. So <clears throat> um, let's start with a general overview of, uh, of the problem. So uh, as you can see, this is uh, somehow a Perkevite uh, diagram. <laughs> so the, the work was divided into two parts. Um, the first part was uh, perception. So giving the drone the ability to uh, understand the geometry of uh, its environment. So you could go even further and try to understand the semantics as well, but uh, we didn't go that far. And well, uh, if the geometric part could work perfectly, that would be already uh, uh, great. So, uh, and the second, uh, the second block, uh, the second, the second big, big part of, uh, of this work is uh, create a planning algorithm that basically uh, take as input the environment representation that could be of uh, many different sorts. Uh, that takes also a nominal trajectory reference that could be either um, uh, the pilot commands or uh, GPS uh, routes, and then outputs a modified trajectory reference that takes account uh, of the presence of uh, obstacle uh, along the way. All right, so let's start with perception. So this is uh, an overview of uh, our um, algorithmic pipeline. So as, as, as you can see, we rely uh, solely on a, on a stereo camera pair. And um, so we have two different um, algorithms that are running in parallel. First one is a classic stereo vision pipe uh, that use uh, both images. And the second pipe is uh, depth from motion. 
uh, that use only uh, one camera, but images from uh, uh, that, that were taken at different time. And the reason why we we have those uh, two pipelines uh, are because uh, Stereovision is great to have a dense uh, depth map, dense information, but it's limited uh, in range. Whereas uh, depth from motion is quite sparse, but you, there is no theoretical limits to uh, to to the maximum depth that you can you can see. So both are interesting. Um, you could also use um, a deep learning approach for the problem, and the reason why we went for uh, classic uh, methods is because we have a hardware that can accelerate them very quickly. And um, as you can, as you, as you all know, uh, it always makes a big difference. But uh, we will we'll, uh, look forward to to develop some deep learning techniques for that matter. And so those two pipes outputs are uh, fused into um, uh, one environment representation, which here is a uh, occupancy grid. So I show you what, what it looks like uh, right after. All right, so let's start with the stereo depth map outputs. So I'm gonna play some videos. Um, hopefully you uh, will see what it looks like. So um, to explain, so the, the um, left image is uh, one of the image of the stereo camera and on your right, you, you have the, um, the depth map and uh, each color uh, represents a depth. So there are less colors and depths actually, but uh, you can, I'm sure you understand uh, uh, what's happening there. Uh, so, and white means that there are no information available. And that's uh, an issue we'll uh, talk about a little bit later. So this is the full resolution depth map. Uh, what we actually use later on after some filtering is a, uh, um, slightly lower resolution one that you can see here. So you can see the, the pixels and well, it looks quite pitched. Uh, it, the, the resolution is actually um, good enough for what we're trying to achieve. Um, we're, for now, we don't try to avoid uh, very small branches. Uh, we, we focus on uh, big obstacles such as trees, bushes, uh, houses. All right, so um, stereo vision is great, but it brings a lot of challenges. Um, so for, first of all, you, to make it work, you need to uh, have a good calibration, which means you, know, you need to know what is the translation orientation between the two cameras. And of course, it does change with uh, uh, while the drone is, um, is moving, when, it's, uh, when the temperature is when you crash, of course. And um, if your calibration is not good enough, then you have um, you can have errors on your uh, depth map. So on the bottom, you can see image, uh, images of a uh, depth map with a, poor, with, a, with a bad calibration. So on the um, bottom left, you can see that because, the, because of the poor calibration, there are a lot of uh, non-available uh, pixels in the depth map. And on the bottom right images, you can see that the roof is not at the, at, um, at the right depth. And so we have an algorithm that, does, uh, that tries to uh, make an online correction of that calibration that was initially done um, uh, uh, in the factory. And you can see on the top images that uh, the, um, uh, it brings a lot of uh, robustness to the depth map. So, uh, but uh, that's um, that's a, a, a big issue uh, we're, that we're addressing here. So another challenge, uh, which are very um, common in uh, stereo matching. Uh, is that stereo performs poorly on textureless surfaces, such as a uh, sky when it's uh, when, when the um, when it's all blue or uh, uh, 
our buildings. Uh, and uh, as you can see here, um, the um, sorry, the sky is uh, all white, which means there are no information available here. So it's a problem because uh, skies uh, often appears in, our, in your image. Uh, here, the situation is very bad because you don't have clouds. Uh, you're in front of the sun. So um, it's a really tough job for this pure matching algorithm to work. And the other, uh, the other um, another common uh, limitation of zero vision is um, the horizontal invariance when you have repetitive patterns on the horizontal axis, such as the roof that you can see here on the, on the image, then uh, the stereo matching algorithm is likely to fail and gives you a, a bad estimate of the depth, which is the case here. You, as you can see, the, the red color means that um, the depths are very close. Um, um, and we, we should expect that the roof uh, would be uh, um, pink or gray, but it's uh, red, meaning that it's uh, maybe uh, two or three meters ahead of us. So uh, that's another issue. So to address uh, these two limitations, we're working on a, uh, another algorithm that tried to detect those situations and help handle them. Um, and um, we also face some other challenge that I didn't, I didn't mention here, such as uh, dirt or rain on the on the on the cameras. Um, so it usually uh, deteriorate the quality of your depth map. So second pipeline is uh, depth from motion. So depth from motion provides you a more sparse information. As you can see, it's uh, um, you have roughly um, uh, 500 points on that image. Uh, the, um, the color stands for the depth. And um, so depth from motion is interesting because it allows you to to see further than stereo does. Uh, and it has its own uh, challenges. So first of all, you have a poor depth quality around the focus of expansion, which is the direction where the drone is heading. Uh, here, you can see it's in the image. It's the white dot right in the middle of the image. And you can see that there are some outliers around these white dots. And it's because uh, around focus of expansion, the signal to noise ratio is very poor. Uh, also, the depth precision really depends on the drone estimations. Uh, uh, so if you don't have a proper attitude estimation, then your, uh, the depths were likely to be bad, uh, which is a problem that you don't have uh, with the uh, stereo. Uh, so right now, our depth from motion uh, pipeline is uh, not good enough to be integrated in our drones, so we're still working on it. Um, but uh, we hope that uh, in the future it will bring some uh, uh, additional value to the whole uh, perception pipe. All right. So once you get those two uh, those two information, we fused it into an occupancy grid. So an occupancy grid is basically a discretized representation of your environment where. Uh, you divide the space that surrounds you into small cubes. Here, uh, 30 centimeters by 50 centimeters. And, um, and uh, the occupancy grid uh, acts like a Bayesian filter, which uh, um, where you, you tell if a, if a cube is more or less uh, empty or full, depending on, on what your uh, input data gives you. Uh, so the, the, um, the main advantages of uh, an occupancy grid is that it gives you a true 3D representation, whereas uh, depth map are uh, somewhere between 2D or 3D. Uh, it allows you, and this is very important, to memorize uh, what, we, what you've seen uh, before, so local past information about the scene. Um, so if you want to avoid while going uh, backward, it's very important that you, you can remember the tree that was just before. Uh, and it always is fusion of multiple sources, uh, which is uh, also very interesting in our case, since we have uh, 
two parallel pipelines. And the main challenge is to is uh, to deal to handle the CPU and memory usage of the grid because the bigger it is, well, the the, um, the harder yeah, it is to to fit it in the in the drone. So I'll give you some a uh, few examples. So this is one of the first occupancy grid that we made uh, several months ago. Um, so here the um, the color also stands for the distance to the cubes. And here we only represent the cube that are, which probability of uh, being uh, occupied is uh, greater than a certain threshold. So, um, and we uh, we blend the, the view of the grid taken from the, the, the camera point of view with the camera image so that we can, we can check whether or not the, um, the, the cubes are, um, are well placed in the in the in the grid. Um, so here you can see that it works quite well, but we have some uh, outliers uh, uh, in the upper part of the image. Uh, so this is another example. All right. So. Um, so here I will show you what's, uh, so um, occupancy grid uh, quality also relies on a drone estimation. And here I'm gonna show you uh, an example of uh, when it fails. So here you can see that because the odometry of the drone was not good enough, um, we didn't um, place the, the, the columns on, the, on, the, on where they should, they should be. And, and so, uh, um, with the drone, as um, uh, with the drone uh, seeing the, the the real position of uh, the two columns, uh, they erase all the cubes here and replace it with the, the true column position. But it means that uh, if if we were going backward very quickly, then we would like hit the hit the columns. So. That's uh, another problem we need to address. But uh, with a good odometry, it works quite well. Um, all right, so this is uh, for the perception part. Uh, so frankly, this is the... Minutes, Martin, is it okay, five minutes? Five minutes, yes. Yeah. Great. So the, the perception part is uh, frankly the, the hardest part uh, of... Uh, process. So um, this is why I talk about the many challenges. So about the replanning algorithm. So basically the idea is to take the occupancy grid that we have seen, the drone estimated states, and to modify the nominal trajectory so that we can uh, uh, avoid obstacles. So that for that matter, we use a model predictive control or MPC, uh, which is a category of algorithm that works quite well for that kind of problem. And it basically tries to uh, find a trajectory parameterization, which along a prediction horizon is the best compromise between uh, avoiding occupied areas, uh, following uh, the nominal trajectory and having a, a feasible trajectory in terms of dynamics. Uh, so it's uh, optimal control for, for those who, who know. Uh, so the, we designed the, the algorithm in, uh, in our simulator, which was very useful, um, as you can imagine, uh, because we don't have going to, to crash. So what you can see here is uh, on the right, the simulator with the drone. The red, uh, red, red points are the, nom the nominal trajectory over the prediction horizon. The blue dots are the, mo the modified trajectory uh, points along the, the, um, the prediction horizon. And on the left, it's an older version of the occupancy grid where all the obstacles are bloated so that we have um, um, a safety distance, but you now we use a, a different uh, algorithm. So as you can see, the, um, the drone is uh, doing quite well. Uh, also because obstacles are quite sparse. Um, 
so uh, we can see the limitation of the algorithm when we come to more challenging environments such as a uh, dense forest but uh, for now we're quite happy because it managed to avoid uh, trees group of trees um, um, mon uh, mountains hills uh, and even buildings so we worked a lot on the simulator to achieve a, a, a to to reach a, a, a good tuning of the algorithm that we then tested on a, in the real world. So I hope that you can see probably the, the video. So the drone is on the middle bottom of the of the video, and we have a. Uh, fl a flight plan that goes right into the trees here. So this was uh, one of uh, our first tests, also filmed by a drone. <laughs> so as you can see, the drone performs uh, an avoidance uh, maneuver and then comes back to the original trajectory. So that was for uh, single obstacles. And now we are um, we are working on the uh, we are testing it on a multiple uh, trajectory um, multiple uh, obstacle trajectories. So here the drone is even smaller. So sorry about that, but it's still in the bottom uh, middle bottom of the image, uh, right in front of the two guys, and uh, the drone is supposed to fly right into the, um, the, the bushes and the tree that you, you can see uh, in, the, in front of it. So I mean, maybe I will send you the YouTube videos of, uh, of, this, um, uh, of those tests because it will be easier to see. And so as you can see, the drone manages to manage to to avoid all the all the trees and the bushes, and uh, yeah, so this is the kind of test that we're conducting right now, um, and um, so now we're in the tuning phase, and uh, hopefully we will uh, embed this technology in our uh, next run that will be released before uh, the end of the year. All right, great, so, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that uh, you, the, the videos were good enough so, uh, so that you could uh, see something. But I, I will send you all the YouTube um, uh, links so that you can see by yourself in a better quality. Great, uh, Martin. Yeah, it would be nice to have the links because I think the video, although the resolution was fine, it was jumping a bit, so then it's hard to... Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it's not great, but... No, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a question for Martin from the audience? Uh, I have one question. Hi, Nile. Hi. Yeah, so I wanted to know where you've been running the MPC and computer vision algorithms on. Are they on board the drone, on the drone's processor itself, or do you have a separate uh, companion computer that does the calculation? Uh, everything is done on board. So uh, it takes a lot of optimization to make it work, of course, because uh, every computer vision algorithm is, uh, is, is big. But we have dedicated hardware to accelerate it, so that helps. And uh, um, MPC can be uh, very tricky, but we we managed to find an implementation that's not too uh, too much of a burden for the CPU. And so it, um, you really need to be careful about uh, what is the model that you use. Um, if, you, if it's a very heavy model, uh, dynamic model of your drone, then um, it's likely that uh, your MPC will run very slow and you need to be very careful about what kind of optimization technique that you use. Um, if you, you, can, you can be very, you can run uh, much faster if you uh, don't have any constraints on your problem. So uh, for instance, an obstacle is not a constraint in terms of uh, optimization. It's, uh, it's, uh, it has a huge cost. You put everything in the cost function. 
and that that really helps to accelerate the resolution of the problem. Yeah, that does answer my question. Thank you so much. This is yeah, really nice work. Thank you. Okay, so uh, in the interest of time, uh, because we're a little bit behind schedule, I would say let's move on and let's see perhaps uh, if Martin is still there at the end. We can still, uh, or if you have questions, ask them in the chat as well. Perhaps Martin can answer them in the chat. So if Martin, if you can stop sharing, then I will sure. start. Thank you very much, uh, Guido. Thank you. Um, Typically on the top of the screen, this side. Thanks, Tisha. All right. Yeah, great. So if you have questions for Martin, please ask them in the chat. And in the meantime, I will start the presentation. So, uh, well, uh, we just saw two presentations, uh, one by uh, Sophie on using communication for collaborative avoid. We just saw a very interesting talk by Martin about uh, avoiding ground-based obstacles. And uh, basically, the third part of the personified project was to work on non-collaborative sense and avoid for small drugs. Steve Delft, we also worked on other things in integration, but this was one of the topics that we tackled. Now, if we uh, look at this graph that you also saw at the opening, and we have these drones that uh, parrot Bebop, then uh, one of the main worries that people have is that uh, these drones will get in the way of or even collide with uh, rescue helicopters or police helicopters. So the question that we ask ourselves with uh, is how can a small drone detect non-collaborative motorized air traffic? And so again, non-collaborative means that this air traffic is not sending its uh, positions uh, via any kind of communication means. Now, if you see the personified project here with the different sensors that we want to look at, then uh, now we're going to talk about basically microphone, eh? so using here in the voice. But before we delve into here in the voice, I would like to still uh, show some examples of C in the voice. I must say that uh, you've all seen uh, probably the presentation of Jack Amina this morning, and he showed some beautiful videos in which yeah, I was impressed that sometimes they're able to detect planes pretty far away, but you really clearly see them only very close to impact. And so I want to give you a little task now. So I'm going to show you an image. You need to try and find the, uh, the drone in this image because we had a plane and a drone flying on a close to collision course. And then we had cameras on board and uh, filmed what they saw. And so uh, here it comes. Here's the image from the plane looking at the drone. So please make a quick decision. We use a great at vision, right? So do you see it? This is where it was. And only a second later, we can actually see it. But then it's really close to the plane already. Oh, sorry. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> so what I'm going to show you now is the other way around. So I'm going to show you the drone and how it sees the plane. Now the plane is pretty big. And it's above the horizon. I can give you that. So please have a look and tell me where it is. Or, or look where it is. I, I typically say, tell me, but it's virtual. And so please try and detect it. It's slightly detectable. It's within this red circle. I don't know if you can see it very well via Zoom, but this is where the plane is. And it's already pretty close. It's above the horizon. Of course, one of the things that we um, should do differently, perhaps, is that yeah, this camera is looking mostly at the ground, so it's a bit over-illuminated above the horizon. But this just shows that there are some you know, difficulties with vision. And uh, what you see, by the way, in the top here is not some kind of animal. It's uh, uh, the cap over the microphone, because we were already at the time, this is an experiment from 2010, we were uh, testing uh, here in the void. I also show you an image one time step later, and now you see the plane clearly uh, on the right here of this, uh, of this image. And this is when they're really uh, pretty close already. So C in the void is challenging. And already this morning, we saw that Jan Camino said that, yeah, if you combine it with radar, for example, that really makes sense. The radar tells you roughly where it is, and then the camera can really yeah, get a very accurate angular measurement. And so what are the challenges? Well, the MAV moves, the drone moves, the aircraft moves. Um, if we want to detect aircraft far away, we need high resolution in pixels per degree. 
Now the aircraft can be anywhere because yeah, here we show a head-on scenario and I saw some of those also this morning, but yeah, the aircraft can in principle come also from behind or below or above. And so you should actually look everywhere if you have a vision only solution. And the aircraft can even be uh, yeah, below the MAV, but also below the horizon, which gives you background clutter. And this is one of the things that John Camino also mentioned and that he's working on now. But I can tell you with background clutter, the problem is much harder. And, uh, so we thought like, okay, see in the void, it is very promising. We actually did some work on it in Persified, but uh, if you want to have this for all around the vehicle, you need high res images if you only rely on vision and this will be very computationally expensive. And so that's why in the Persified project, we focused on here in the void. Now, why here in the void? The microphone, just like the camera, by the way, is small and power efficient. And the low frequency sound of manned aircraft, of motorized manned aircraft, is loud and carries far. As I think about my kids, they often hear a helicopter and then they look and they say, hey, daddy, there's a helicopter there. And this is the kind of thing that we think that drones can also do. It helps detection from all sides. So, I mean, yeah, you can hear the sound from all directions. And in principle, you're only processing a 1D time signal. So in terms of information, it is much more compressed than actually visual information. And you can use one microphone, then you can use it for detection of uh, aircraft. You can also use multiple microphones. In that case, you can also determine the angle to uh, aircraft or other UAPs. And uh, yeah, if you take this further, then you can do more than detection. Then you can actually Perhaps it's better to, yeah, <laughs> mute, sorry. <laughs> so uh, you can actually go beyond it. You can uh, detect an engine and recognize an aircraft and perhaps also even determine distance. Now, our first focus was on detection because we think this is the basis. This can be done with one microphone and it could be used, for example, for triggering an autonomous landing when the aircraft is still far away. And so if we had a very reliable method like this um, on a uh, commercial drones, then we would have prevented many incidents where, for example, in the Netherlands, the rescue helicopter was not able to land close to a victim because there was a drone that tried to film uh, what was happening there. And if the drone had this microphone, would detect the helicopter with enough certainty, it would have landed and the helicopter could have continued. Now, one of our main problems here was uh, data. So, uh, yeah, if you go online, you can find a few sounds of helicopters or planes, but it's not very realistic, it lacks ground truth, and so uh, it's problematic. And that's why uh, uh, what you see here is Dirk is uh, one of our master students who worked on this project. And he went to an airstrip in the Netherlands on a particularly sunny day uh, with uh, a microphone array. And uh, yeah, he, he recorded many helicopters landing there on that day. Now, what did we do then with this data? So we transformed the audio to a spectrogram. That's what you see on the left. So we have the x-axis is the time and the y-axis is the frequencies that are present in the signal. And what we do then is we take a time window from this uh, spectrogram, that's the red box. We pass it into a convolutional neural network, which is a big deep uh, neural network that processes this data and outputs uh, classification of there being a helicopter or not. And we train this, and then what we get is we get a certain number of uh, true positives and false positives, depending on the threshold that we choose. Now, true positives are good. And if you have a true positive rate of one, which you can see on the, on the y-axis, then uh, you detect all the helicopters in the data set. Uh, on the other hand, false positives are not so nice. If you have a false positive, and you actually act on it by uh, landing, then you don't want this to happen too often if there is no helicopter. And a false positive rate of 0 0.2 means that uh, one out of five samples is mistakenly classified as having a helicopter. So if your window length is three seconds, uh, then uh, this means that once every 15 seconds, your drone is landing for nothing. And of course, this will never be accepted by uh, users. And so uh, yeah, what we're actually interested in in this graph is this very, very far left region in which you have very few false positives. And perhaps at one out of 10 flights, you don't mind that it gives a false alarm to land. I don't know, but such a threshold is perhaps acceptable. 
Now, still, if you look at our current uh, data, and these were preliminary experiments, uh, what we show here, the different colors show different window lengths. So how many seconds do you give to the network? You see that if you go from 3 to 10 to 15 seconds, it becomes better and better. Still, if you look at the very far left region, then you see that even with a window length of 10 seconds, we can get roughly 38% of the air traffic. Now, this is not great, of course, if you only rely on here in the void, but it is actually uh, helping if you rely on many other measures uh, as well. And so we think that, uh, yeah, this is a, a obviously still a work in progress, but it is at least promising. I'll show you two samples as, a, as an example. On the left, we have a spectrogram. Um, what you see is uh, with the black line is the output of the network, which becomes higher if it thinks that there is a helicopter. You see in red, you see our, uh, our labeling. You see that this black line goes above the purple line, which is the threshold, uh, during this period between 30 and 40 seconds. So it correctly identifies the helicopter. But we also have samples like on the right, where it can happen that uh, at some point, for example, we show this false positive, and that the, the network outputs a high value above the threshold while there's no helicopter yet, or it's very far away. And on the right, we see that where we have our labeling, the red line going high, the network is actually still giving relatively low values. And these are false negatives. So we, we miss the, the helicopter. And, but we also have a true positive in the end. So when the helicopter gets really close, we get a spike in the activation of the neural network and we actually detect uh, the, the, the helicopter. So our conclusions on here in the void are that it is promising for detecting loud manned aircraft but uh, the current processing results are insufficient. Now, what we did is we made our data set openly available at the 40U Dataverse. So if you follow this link, you can download all these helicopter sounds we made. And uh, yeah, this is something we need more work on in the future. Now, in my talk, uh, of course, I talked about non-collaborative uh, voids, but I also wanted to draw some main conclusions about uh, the project. And the main conclusion is that it is possible to create very lightweight suites for staying well clear of both static obstacles, ground-based, and other flying air vehicles, requiring minimal adjustments to current hardware and software used by drone producers. And so what I show here is not the main package we made, because that was actually shown by uh, Sophie already. What I show here is what we call the micro package. On the left, we have a stereo vision system where uh, the stereo board itself was made by Christophe de Wachter from TU Delft, uh, so by, uh, by us as the consortium. But uh, uh, the processor is a Jevois smart camera processing system with four CPUs and one GPU, so it's actually pretty powerful. And in total, this system weighs 21 grams, uh, 20.59, sorry. Uh, so uh, that's, that's very good, of course, very lightweight. On the right, we see this very uh, lightweight FiPi chip uh, which is commercially available. And it has uh, LTE, it has Wi-Fi, it has LoRa, it even has Bluetooth. And together with the antenna, and where the most weight actually goes to the plastic around the antenna, uh, this weighs 25.46 grams. So in total, we have a system of 46.05 grams that is able to avoid ground-based obstacles, is able to get information from the internet, can communicate on longer ranges via LoRa with, uh, to deconflict at an early stage, and that is able actually with Wi-Fi to also avoid at a very close range collaboratively. And so this package is uh, shown here. So here we show just the stereo vision system and we show it mounted on a trash can, an Iashin trash can a racing drone. It's a tiny drone, it's like 10 centimeters big. It can lift this system and then be uh, very autonomous. And uh, here we show the results of the stereo vision in, uh, in real time. And so we see the depth map at the bottom. We see that it runs at uh, more than real time, so 34 uh, frames per second, with actually a pretty high uh, resolution. Here we see the, uh, the communication package that we put also in a little white box and mounted on the Bebop. And what you see here is the full system and mounted on the Bebop 2. So we have uh, the stereo vision system and we have the, uh, the communication system. Uh, making this drone yeah, super safe uh, while being very uh, yeah, lightweight in terms of payload. Now, what is, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's many things cool about this thing, but 
Uh, what I think is extra cool is that yeah, you can just buy all this stuff. Right? So you can buy the FiPi, you can buy the Jivo Smart Cam, and uh, our stereo vision board, we will make it open hardware. And we're now looking uh, and working with a vendor to see if this can also be a product that you can just buy. And then these things are all yeah, completely available to the community to make even small drones uh, very, very safe. Now, there's a second main conclusion, and that is that non-collaborative sense in the void is the least mature safety net. And it mostly suffers from the lack of data sets and for benchmarking performance and for machine learning. And like I said this morning, I didn't talk with Jan Gandina about this, but indeed, I, I fully agree with him that, that uh, yeah, we need to do real flight tests and they're difficult to arrange. So we need to get permissions for those to gather the data that we then need to make these systems work, these non-collaborative sense of the void systems. And on the one hand, there's a task for academia here. But on the other hand, yeah, I don't know uh, if they're watching, uh, but uh, if you're a funding agency, uh, please uh, look also at funding uh, the work that is necessary to make these data sets, uh, because uh, that is very important. These are very involved experiments. And uh, we as academia are willing, of course, to make these data sets. But uh, we also need, of course, some help there for financing. Yeah, because if we want uh, non-collaborative sense in the void, yeah, data sets from real flight tests are key. So that was me pleading for money for the community, by the way. But uh, so uh, and I hope that these data sets will be there. Now, I also took 15 minutes, which is actually a little bit too long. So I would like to thank the partners for what I think is a very successful uh, project. And uh, yeah, if you have a single question for me, then uh, I can still answer that before we go to the uh, keynote speakers again. And if there's no question, that's also fine because for time, that's perfect. Okay, so let's assume uh, that there's no question. If you do have a question or you don't dare to ask it now, and then please type it in the chat and uh, we from TU Delft will answer questions there. So um, let's then immediately go on to the next speaker, who is Frank uh, Welkenhuizen uh, from uh, Drone Matrix. Uh, and uh, he's going to uh, yeah, tell us uh, yeah, his story about the sixth uh, network. So thank you very much, Frank, that you're able to be here. And, uh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Do you thank hear me? We hear you perfectly, and you can share your screen. Okay. We see your okay. Uh, I have my co-presenter with me. Uh, with me, uh, Hido. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, the presentations until now were extremely interesting for our vision about the uh, Six Network. I uh, so I tell you, keep on the good work, and uh, let's go on. And. Um, I do a, a, a small introduction about the company. Our company is a part of Risk Matrix. So you know the origin of a company. It's a technology company with a focus on ERP system for security companies. And we are working uh, in 20 countries as we speak today in Europe, Middle East, Asia, and Australia. But we, uh, aerial robotics uh, has our special attention. Uh, we entered in the drone market in uh, 2013 with uh, a vision and uh, a mission, and that was focusing on only entering in the market in 2021-25. So we took a long time to get there. Uh, so our technology are completely different uh, as uh, the normal drones and so we need this kind of technologies what 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 you are talking about because we are focused on, on autonomously behavior of the drone the network connecting uh, uh, systems secure communication and of course the ai on board so uh, this we're going to explain you in the next uh, nine minutes uh, i give the floor to my co-presenter frederick winters who is chief business developer at the uh, risk matrix group and I welcome him also. Freddy, can you take over at this yeah. point? All right, if all goes well, you can also hear me. 
Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Hear. So let me start off with, with the, the value proposition of the SIX network and, and what it is about actually. Um, the SIX network we consider actually as a, a airspace uh, layer that we will uh, use. This is the use space layer where we will actually install and deploy a mesh network of drones <clears throat> that will be focusing on automated ro aerial robotic work. Yeah. So instead of um, in, the side, in the current drone market where companies that want to use drone services, they have to, down, they have to purchase, install, and maintain drone solutions themselves, which makes it sometimes a hard business case to sell. We actually share drones as a service layer that will perform aerial robotic work on demand for multiple customers in the region. Yeah. So we see that we have a lot of business cases like agriculture, security, architecture, construction, inspection, and so on, that are all business cases that get a bigger added value when these are, when these are performed by drones that are shared through the concept of airtime. Yeah. So within the airspace overview, you will see that was we say ARWS, the Aerial Robotic Work Solution, is actually a platform that will uh, that will communicate with the UTM and the ATC systems and that will be operating as an LU within the the, the U space LUC regulation uh, that will allow customers to count on these drones to be available in cities in harbor environments in uh, agricultural environments to perform duties for them um, the sixth network, as we call this, is like the next step above 5G. It's the same principle. We will de be deploying drone mesh solutions that are available as per demand. It's the same like using data from the 5G. Yeah. Um, this will, of course, be handled by a use space service operator um, that will directly interface with all the uh, drone traffic managers that are uh, in the geographical scope of the six network, and that will allow drone operators, but also autonomous solutions to be provided to the customers. <clears throat> Taking a look a bit at the legal framework under which we are, of course, subject, um, we started um, also in communication with the Belgian government when the first Belgian drone law was created in 2016. This is now being converted into a European le legislation, which is applied in Belgium at the end of last year, and that is starting its commercial rollout over the next two years. So we are ahead of time there, and we will be ready with this drone solution when this legal framework is in operation. Now, talking about this uh, six network, we think about a mesh grid, a geographical coverage of the drones that can uh, operate within a specific perimeter. And when the customer wants to, for example, in the case of police, wants to use a drone solution over a vast area of uh, geographical coverage, these drones will hand over their duty once they have reached their action radius. Huh? Because of, as you know, drones are limited by battery capacity, meaning that they have a specific perimeter in which they can operate and then they have to go back to their, as we call it, docking station to allow for the drones to recharge and uh, take off again. Um, drone Matrix has been building as a drone company itself, three drone solutions. The Titus solution is the first one we, we operate and this is the a tethered drone. So, so this drone has no free airspace, uh, but it's a cable drone that is immediately linked to the ground station. Um, the second drone, this is the drone where we will build the six network on from our end, is a Jacob solution. This is a fully automated drone that can perform autonomously, taking off from the Jacob docking station and performing its duty in the area using a payload that is predefined. And the last solution we have is the Eustus. This is a VTOL solution, vertical takeoff and landing used for uh, large coverage, these drones can have an action radius of uh, 100 kilometers. So this is a very different use case, but we will focus today more on the Jacob solution as it is the basis for exploiting and creating a 
grid network. This grid network has found its initial ideas in projects that we have done in uh, cities, in harbor areas, um, also in agricultural areas. So we see that also on the operational level, the politics level, and on the sponsor level, we have the parties necessary that are backing us to realize this in Belgium, but also in the rest of Europe and even abroad, as we have partnerships in Asia and the Middle East. So this the Jacob Intelligent uh, Network drone, as we call it, is actually powered already today by a software environment that is open to use and we call this our ARWS software platform that will allow government instances, companies, private companies to order drone missions to capture the data, perform data services on top of this inside a shared application approach where external software companies can actually publish inside the data service library their own AI application that is at that time available for customers to order and they only pay as per the data used and the airtime that they use. Here you can see some visualizations of our drone Jacob solution. Yeah, as you see, it's an autonomous drone docking station solution that is built up with a lot of hardware technology focused on smart and safe transport. So there has, there's a parachute inside. Um, we uh, automate it with, a, with as much uh, communication protocols as possible. There's, a, there's many fail safes implemented. Uh, there's remote intervention that can be done. The drone docking station will protect the drone, will cool the drone, will even uh, inspect and maintain the drone if necessary. All of this is implemented to provide a solid base for constructing the network. I have a video here that I want to show you quickly. This is a video demonstration on uh, a flight that we have done for the city of Antwerp uh, at the harbor environment also. So we will see that the drone uh, is uh, taking off autonomously and flying towards a uh, collision incident that has been reported by the police services. And immediately from the moment the drone takes off, it will try to make a uh, a flight that is also avoiding any obstacles or, uh, or buildings that is not allowed to fly over. Um, and at that time during the flight, also the AI is run doing people detection, as you can see here, doing car vehicle detection. Um, we also implement on top of the RGB image, if required, a infrared image, which we will also be using in a few seconds. That will allow us to also detect whether or not there is like, uh, for example, a uh, fire happening when the collision was happen has happened between the two cars and all of these. Or we can also use this detection as it's now gonna be turned on to, for example, identify and follow people that are running away from the incident as they may be criminals or something and that they have to be searched and found by the police. Yeah. So this is an, an a, a autonomous flight, but also remotely controlled in case there are uh, um, positions of interest where the drone has to make a 360 overview and so on. So here you can see the overlay of the infrared to enhance the artificial intelligence. Yeah. Here you can also see that yeah, the, the criminal or uh, the subject was captured by the police and we uh, have, a, have an eye from the sky with an artificial intelligence on top. This is one of these services that are run in the SIX network the police simply requests, I want to have a drone on the position. The network automatically intelligently selects the correct drone, lets the drone take off, fly towards the position. If the battery is going low, another drone is being called in to replace the previous drone, so the service is guaranteed. So this is yeah, the end of the video, more or less. So the artificial intelligence, as we said, is very important here. Uh, we have a drone that is built up with many sensors, many uh, GPU processing power. Uh, so this allows for uh, the uh, artificial intelligence to be run not only on board, we do this mainly, mainly on board, but we can also use edge computing principles to even enhance this. And next to that, very important for us is sense and avoid. Uh, we base this on 360 LIDARs for short range sense and avoid. 
but we also implement ADSB, Flarm, Radar. Uh, we combine also these technologies in, in duplicate with the flight computer to make sure that uh, sense and avoid can be done. And this is something that we keep on uh, increasing on a level of uh, implementation and research. Uh, and that's why we, of course, are very interested in this uh, Persevit project. Another case I can show you here is some static images where why we use also the infrared, for example, on the level of AI. You can see on the right top that there is already AI being run on the vehicles with a percentage of recognition. But uh, as we do not see here on the picture, actually in the smoke part on the left top, there is a person inside that is trapped in a burning apartment. Um, so thanks to the fact that we can enhance our view and our AI with uh, uh, infrared images, we can immediately detect that there is a person screaming and uh, uh, gesticulating to be rescued from the, uh, the building that is on fire at that time. So these enhancements are just data layers, as we call them, data services. And these data services are open to all app builders uh, that are in the world that build smart applications, smart business cases on these drones. So we believe that service providers and app builders can provide all these technologies to, for example, police, but also private companies for inspections, also security companies for, for guarding tasks and so on. Um, and all these apps are implemented through an API on top of the SIX network so that these app builders can also benefit financially from uh, publishing these uh, data AI services. There's many of them, as you can see here, um, when we talk and we collaborate with parties all over the world, every day new business cases pop up, new AI intelligent cases, new inspections and so on pop up. So yeah, there's uh, a lot of potential here. So if we talk about the, the business model, this is one of the last parts already. So I uh, light speeded the presentation a bit for you guys. Um, when you talk about the, the business model, uh, for drone matrix, there's actually a, a multiple approach. We think about the hamburger approach. We turn a hamburger on its side. And what we want to do is actually be the real technology provider on that ARWS software and hardware platform. Also, we are open on a hardware platform. Other drone builders that comply to the standards that we set, we can, they can also build the drone technology to expand the SIX network. Yeah? But on our end, we focus on building that whole environment, that whole uh, operational model where drones and applications find their way to the customer in a data service approach. Of course, this is built on a few basic foundations that are very important. One is connectivity. If you have dropouts or stability issues, then the reliability goes down very fast. Second thing is automation on flight permits. It's very cumbersome today to get a flight permit. And if there are specific environments where this is even harder, like the VESO companies, this is near to impossible. So we are collaborating on a daily basis with the companies that are going to be the USPs of tomorrow. And these uh, companies are working together with us to automate a mission request from the customer to an approval without all that uh, manual work around. Yeah. So that planning can be done also in an ad hoc situation. If the police wants to have a drone up in the air, they simply want to push a button and it has to work. Yeah. Then of course, optimal and safe navigation. Yeah, the worst thing that can happen to a SIX network is if a drone drops out of the air or a drone collides into another flying object. Yeah. That's a that's, uh, bad, bad uh, commercial. So we uh, need to guarantee that the technical uh, mitigation of risks is implemented and also the statistical uh, risk management is done. We do that through 4D routing, meaning that we work together with partners who do mobility analysis and so on, that will implement a dynamic flight plan into the drone throughout the time to evade risky environments, people, many people crowding together and so on. And together with uh, de-conflicting technology uh, that is also uh, implemented on the drone, but also communicated 
through the USB directly through us so that we know where other drones are flying at that time and other flying objects like helicopters and planes. So that drone to drone, drone to, air, uh, to airplane, but also the drone to infrastructure, that's part of the 4D routing, um, is actually uh, implemented inside our drone technology and inside the drone technology of other drone builders that are granted access to the SIX network. All right, that was our story a bit in a nutshell. I hope it was more or less clear. Oh, it's very clear and uh, very inspiring, I think. Uh, uh, to, so uh, clearly showing, yeah, how autonomy is going to play a huge role, actually, if you want uh, yeah, such a network to uh, provide many services. So really great. Thank you very much. Is, is there a question from the audience? Uh, there is a question in the chat. Ah, let me see. So let me ask that, uh, where and how are the interface descriptions API available? Which standards are you using? Well, that's a work in progress. <laughs> so uh, um, with respect to the, to the APIs, we are collaborating with the respective uh, companies uh, who will be receiving the data or who will be building the data. Um, as we speak, we are constructing a, a project for the next uh, two to three years that actually elaborates on that part greatly. So uh, if there is uh, interest from partners here that can provide us with valuable input, for example, we are always very willing to receive that information and collaborate in the future together on that. Great. Well, thank you for the very inspiring presentation. and. Uh, we, we go on to the last speaker, so that's uh, Andrew Haitley from uh, Eurocontrol, uh, who uh, was also the leader of the CONOPS consortium uh, within a, yeah, a group of CESAR projects uh, focusing on yeah, integrating drones into our skies. So thank you very much, Andrew, that uh, you were willing to give a keynote speech today. So I'm, I'm very honored to have you here, and I would like to pass uh, the word to you and the floor to you. Okay, you hear me okay? Yes. <clears throat> okay, good. I'll stop my video because I think it's eating up bandwidth and I'll just go to sharing the presentation. Great. Okay. Uh, do you see that? Yeah, I think you do. Right, get rid of that. Yes. So what, what I wanted to do, uh, I'm actually replacing Ludovic who can't be here today. And Ludovic would have put uh, a lot of, he would have described the overall program, which uh, Persevite is part of. And I am not really going to do that. I want to more talk about the place of sense and avoid in U-Space to try and put the Persevite work into the perspective of where U-Space is going. Uh, right. So the overview of the research, you can download this nice document. Um, it's available on the CESAR uh, website and it describes there were nine exploratory research projects launched in 2017. Persevite is the last of these to close. All of the others have finished. Um, and it was followed, those nine were followed quite quickly by 10 demonstrations which have looked at the state of the art. And these nine exploratory projects have looked at many different aspects of how space should work. Um, and Persevite is a little bit uh, uncommon compared to the others in being so focused on onboard equipment. There was a lot of interest in on the ground stuff, uh, how, how the use space services provided from the ground should work and so on. Uh, Persevite was one of two projects that looked more at the, uh, the airborne needs. Um, there have subsequently been other rounds of research call and uh, some more projects are just starting up. Alberto, who's online, is, is uh, very active in one of these, which is to do with separation. A quick overview of, of the U-space airspace. This uh, picture came from the Chorus project. And the focus of U-space currently is the very low level. And we have uh, described the, the airspace as um, being broken into different kinds of volume. 
the X, Y, and Z volumes. The X is low risk, but low level of service. The Y is higher risk, and operation in Y requires an approved operation plan. And there may be specific technical requirements on operations. And Z is the highest risk. And Z comes in two flavors. There is controlled airspace, which is like now, airports and things like that. And there is ZU, where there is, I'll come to it in a minute, sort of control from U space. So what is this all about? It's all about separation. Uh, the um, distinction is really how is separation uh, achieved and what is the separation that will be achieved? In the X volume, the remote pilot is completely responsible for separation and he is unassisted by U space. So the X volume is uh, well adapted to visual line of sight operation, um, less well adapted to anything else, which I'll come back to in a moment. In the Y volume, we have strategic separation, which means that the um, flight plans, the operation plans are deconflicted before they take off. But this requires that we can, uh, we check that the flights are following their plans. So conformance monitoring becomes very important in the Y volume. Uh, and the separation between the, the uh, deconflicted flights has to be wide enough to account for all of the uncertainties that may crop up in the flight. And if there's no conformance monitoring, the uncertainties are enormous. So the se separation is enormous and the uh, capacity of the air is very low. Finally, in Z volumes, we have tactical separation, which is uh, separation instructions given during the flight. And in the ZA volume, these come from air traffic control. And in the ZU volume, they come from U space. And the point of the Z is to, to allow much higher density of operation as the uncertainties which um, may crop up during flight can be dealt with during flight. So the separation at the flight planning period can be a little less. So this comes back to something which was already mentioned, I think, twice. Uh, John Camin mentioned it, and Sophie also mentioned it the so-called Swiss cheese model of aviation safety, uh, where we have different layers of services which are providing safety. And in the rare cases that the holes in all of the layers line up, we end up with a problem. Now the traditional um, uh, separation of these layers, the first one is strategic, but that includes such things as the airspace design that uh, some kinds of problems are uh, permanently avoided by saying that certain kinds of operations are simply not allowed. But then set strategic conflict resolution also will include operation plan um, uh, management to avoid conflicting operations. The second layer that we have here is the tactical, the in-flight conflict resolution, which are these instructions from the ground during flight. The third layer is collision avoidance, which is really what uh, this whole day has been about. Persevite is about developing a collision avoidance uh, means for small, small drones. And so uh, I'll, I'll come to a moment why this is so important. The final layer is providence, which is a nice word for saying luck. And we might say, well, we don't really want to get into that consideration. We don't want to depend on luck. But in fact, we do it all the time. There was a comment from Sophie about the what are the separation minima which are needed. The separation minima is actually just a way of increasing the amount of providence that we're relying on. The larger that we separate the, the drones in, in the four-dimensional space, the less likely they are to hit each other if none of the other three layers have worked. So we constantly have to have in mind how this is all working. A little bit of uh, background on the, on the strategic, uh, yeah, I've already mentioned most of this. So the strategic conflict resolution service is something which is defined in the U-Space um, blueprint and the U-Space CONOPS and so on. And it explains 
how the flights are deconflicted. And as I say, conformance monitoring allows this to be, uh, allows less reliance on the provenance layer. The tactical conflict resolution is a bit more problematic. Now, in the ZA volume, we have operation as now. We have air traffic controllers. We have uh, VHF radio. Probably uh, in the future for drones, there'll be a message-based system. Uh, but at the moment, VHF radio, tactical controllers, and we know it works. But the ZU volumes are managed by U-space. And the ZU volumes are typically declared in what is class G airspace. So these are um, not legally controlled uh, airspaces. These are uncontrolled airspaces. Further, in the early days of U space, we're still grappling to, to understand and get used to the performance of our surveillance, our comms, the navigation performance of the drones, uh, the abilities of the pilot, all of these factors are still very much uncertain. And so in, in the short term, it will be an extremely brave uh, use space service provider who provides a separation service in the sense defined by ICAO, uh, where the service provider is legally liable for providing separation and is responsible if the separation is lost. As a result of this, the ZU will probably exist as an area in which the tactical conflict resolution is advisory. Well, what use is that, you ask? It still will add efficiency. The tactical uh, conflict resolution from the ground is an opportunity to provide an optimized resolution of an airborne conflict. There can be much earlier warning than is likely with collision avoidance, which will result in much smaller deviations from the planned track of the vehicles concerned. There can be an overall system optimization where if one flight is interacting with several others, it's more interesting to act on that one flight than on many of the others. So tactical uh, conflict resolution in use space can have a value, uh, even if it's advisory, but it cannot provide the last line of safety. And so uh, the ZU airspace is currently understood is absolutely infeasible without either enormous separation, which defeats the purpose, or sense and avoid, which is where you come in. So the Persevite project has been working on sense and avoid or detect and avoid as it's known if it's collaborative, uh, which is a key enabler for what is termed U3, the third level of, of U space in which we start to have these tactical conflict resolution services. And it will enable much more dense operations than are otherwise capacity, uh, kept possible. And in doing so, it will release a great deal of airspace capacity which may actually bring some operations into commercial viability, which are not otherwise viable. Sense and avoid will also enable integration with manned traffic, particularly if we can find a way to have the manned traffic adopt the same technology for their own benefit. Uh, there was some discussion earlier about, have we got a calibration of the human pilot and their ability to detect uh, drones. Well, the fact is that the human pilot is pretty bad at detecting other aircraft. The uh, general aviation um, community have a fairly horrific record on safety at the moment. And it may be that if uh, technology is available, which is cheap and um, well accepted and reliable, that it may be adopted by manned aviation for its own benefit without even considering uh, the desire to integrate with drone traffic. And finally, sense and avoid will improve safety in all of X, Y, and Z. It will be a way to enable beyond visual line of sight in X, if you can write a reasonable SORA to justify it. If you have a decent detect and avoid system, you should in theory be able to fly in among other aircraft who are not expecting you to arrive. 
So senesinavoid is the key enabler for U3, but we need to get from a research project into deployment. So the first step, we need something which is cheap and small and light and low power. And Persevite has provided that or is on the way to providing that. We have prototypes and, and early versions. The next step will be standardization. We need to have a standardization of the technical uh, means and a standardization of the operating procedures. What should the drone do when uh, an, uh, a conflict is detected using a sense and avoid system? What should a manned aircraft do? As I said, we need to have compatibility with manned aviation, but also acceptance by that community. And I think there's a great deal of work to be done in convincing manned aviation to adopt this technology, in training them how to use it, in getting their, their buy-in for this kind of work. And finally, it needs to be mandatory. We, we can't have a useful system of, of detect and avoid if, if it's only on a small fraction of the aircraft. It needs to be generally used before these operating procedures can be followed. So it may be mandated by regulation, it may be mandated by uh, risk avoidance. SORA already mentions detect and avoid as a risk uh, mitigation. It may be mandated as being an entry requirement for certain airspaces. As I said, the Y airspace may have technical requirements um, applied to it. You are not able to fly here without certain equipment. That equipment might be uh, the Persevite sense and avoid package. It may also be in, mandated by insurance. There has been a great uptake of FLAM in recent times, driven mostly by the fact that you can get cheaper insurance if you fit it. So the, the, the same non-regulatory uh, means may result in the adoption of sense and avoid. If we have a quick look at uh, standardization, there is some way to go. And I would very much hope that this work in Persevite can be fed into some of these activities. There's a lot of activity on the moment on ACAS SXU. Uh, they have started with ACAS XU and started to shrink it a bit. The focus is not so much on the sensor package, but on what to do when a conflict is detected. I would see quite a nice complementarity between the Persevite work and ACAS SXU. And I would hope that we can bring this work to their attention. Uh, ASTM has picked up a lot of drone work recently. They have a collaboration agreement with Gutma. So in F-38, there are two teams working on detect and avoid. And the first one of these is collaborating with the ACAS SXU team. Uh, there's also the Homeland Security, which uh, I know less about. They, they have been uh, looking at um, um, aerial response robots. In Europe, we have Working Group 105 who are actively working on two documents. There's an OSED for detect and avoid in very low level operations, which is currently being developed. And there's a minimum operational performance standard for DAA in very low level. And finally, NATO have published uh, a document. This STANREC is, is available now, which is uh, an overview of UAS sense and avoid. So there's still quite a number of opportunities where the Persevite work can be injected into current standardization and perhaps appear as being a recommended implementation. With regulation, we're in a fuzzier position. Uh, there's absolutely no mention of sense and avoid in either of the two regulations which are already published in the acceptable means of compliance and guidance material to the um, implementing regulation, there is a mention of detect and avoid as being something which is in SORA as um, a, a mitigation. Uh, but in the opinion of the use face regulation, which was published in the early part of this year, there's again, uh, only reference to detect and avoid as some future technology, which is not currently available. Hopefully during the time that this opinion will, will gestate into a regulation, we can update that and, and get them to mark detect and avoid as a currently available thing, which is not widely deployed, but certainly exists. 
And as already mentioned, um, Jaras mentioned uh, detect and avoid as a specific operation risk mitigation in their SORA uh, edition two. So where are, we, where are we? Well, we have a very important building block provided here. Thank you, Persevite. But there's still a lot to do to get it into actual use. And I think we all have to work on this and we, we, we have to do it because uh, all too often these research projects create a great big buzz and it dies away. But here there's, there's genuine um, uh, societal improvement possible by applying the outcome of this project. And I really hope that uh, we can find a way to keep this uh, activity going and push it into the next stages. So here I end my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Very nice talk. Let me also give the virtual. Uh... So thank you very much. Are there questions uh, for Andrew from the audience? I see a question from Mario uh, in the chat. Oh, yeah. yeah. Are, are there standardized data exchange requirements to and from UTM, ATM? Not currently. This is uh, the subject of, of still ongoing research work. Uh, so, nothing yet. There's also another question on whether it's uh, the kind of regulation will be like technology. Uh, like everybody has to use the same technology, like being prescriptive, or whether we should talk about the same performance, so more technology agnostic. So what is your opinion there? Well, obviously, if we're going to try and have a common uh, collaborative scheme, it has to be prescriptive. We have to say, what is the standard you must follow? But apart from that, yeah, clearly, uh, any reasonably well-written regulation has to describe the outcome rather than the means to get there, because uh, there's no point in second guessing the standards bodies. Typically, these regulations, uh, if you look in, in the two EU regulations that have been published, they will refer to the guidance material. And in the guidance material, which is a uh, less formal document, they then refer to standards. The, the uh, SORA and so on is currently identified as one acceptable means of compliance with the regulation. If something else comes along, SORA will be one of several. Um, so they keep their options open by not being too prescriptive usually in, in regulation. Great, is there still a burning question for Andrew at the moment? If there's not, then I would like to thank Andrew again. And uh, I would actually like to thank all the speakers today for uh, yeah, what, uh, of course, we, we, we held this as a virtual symposium uh, because of the corona situation. But uh, I must say, I am very happy that we could uh, still organize it like this. I think it was very interesting and uh, yeah, inspiring. And I hope that people also got in touch with each other via the chat uh, to still uh, discuss some things. I also see some very nice YouTube videos. Uh, so. Uh, and thank you uh, in the chat for uh, also finding this uh, nice symposium today. So thank you all for attending. We will uh, make the YouTube stream, we will make it available on our website, uh, persevite.org. As you can also watch back uh, some of the most amazing moments. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so uh, we wish you all a very nice day. Stay safe, stay healthy. And who knows, we may see each other in the real world uh, one of these days. So. Thank you all for coming. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, Thank you. Bye. goodbye to everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to have a have uh, to wait a little bit for the YouTube to catch up the 30 second delay and then I'll end the stream here. Sure, Nilay, sure.